Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of the City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel and those of you listening on OPB FM or KBPS AM radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 23rd of January, 2009. Our program today will feature a presentation of the intersection of race and politics in today's America. But before we begin our program, I have several announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phone or any other uh, device that might make noise. We are pleased to acknowledge our four Friday Forum corporate sponsors for this quarter, without whose generous financial support these City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our four corporate sponsors for this quarter are UBS, Girding Edlin Development Company, Pacific Power, and The Standard. We thank them all for their support. Now, on behalf of City Club, I also want to sincerely thank everyone who has donated to our annual fund campaign so far this year. Like uh, so many nonprofit organizations, City Club's membership dues finance less than half of our annual operating budget. And as a result, our annual fund campaign constitutes an essential element of financing of the pro club's fr programs like this one today. And despite the club's status as a 93-year-old iconic Portland institution, the fact is that we simply would not be successful as an organization without our annual fund contributors. So with this in mind, could everyone in the room who donated to the club's annual fund so far this year, please stand up and be recognized. So if you've contributed, please stand up. Thank you. And thank you, all of you, for your generous support. And if you've not yet given to this uh, important annual fundraising campaign uh, in support of City Club, please know that the 2008-2009 annual fund drive is still ongoing and that we encourage all of you, every member certainly, but also all of you, although you may not be a City Club member, nonetheless are a friend of the club and benefit from its existence. We invite all of you to make an annual fund contribution. Large or small, $25 or $2,500, every contribution helps. And large or small, every contribution is 100% tax deductible on your state and federal income taxes. Ted K, our treasurer, keeps reminding us of that. So remember, there's a discount on every uh, contribution you make to City Club because you get a, a state and federal income tax deduction. So if you were not standing up a minute ago, uh, please join your fellow citizens who were and support City Club by giving to our annual fund this year. For information on how to give, talk to our uh, staff at the back of the room or call the club office or simply go on our website. Uh, I'd like to introduce two new members who are with us today. I'd like each of them to stand and remain standing. Uh, Sean Martin, who's Regional Claims Manager for Travelers Insurance, and also Stephen Chips. Welcome to you both. Uh, I would also like to welcome students from Portland Community College who have joined us today. Instructor Kathleen Nadal is here with her Speech 101 Oral Communications class. Now one aspect of this course is the importance of oral communication skills for use in public discourse by participants in our community. A subtext of the class is democracy in action. So we are pleased, of course, that City Club provides a forum for insights into these subjects for these students. And please help me welcome Kathleen Nadal and her class from PCC. Please stand and be recognized wherever you are. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Please know that City Club is now poised to launch a new research study of regional transportation governance in the Portland metropolitan area and is looking for volunteers to serve on the committee. The study committee, which will be chaired by member Steve Griffith, Steve, are you here today? Not here today. Uh, is charged with examining whether the governance structure for transportation decision making in the Portland region is adequate to tackle the challenges we face as a region relating to population growth, our aging transportation infrastructure, increasing costs of petroleum-based modes of transportation, and of course, climate change. 
Now, City Club's time-honored and citizen-driven research program is a truly unique aspect of what City Club does and has done since its inception in 1916. No other organization in this state, and perhaps in the country, does the kind of citizen-driven, unbiased, fact-based research that City Club does. And being on a research study committee is a fabulous opportunity for you as a citizen to gain a deep understanding of an important public policy area to interact directly, and by that I mean right across the table, with key stakeholders and public and private leaders and decision makers in our broader community, and to have a significant and positive influence on public policy. Moreover, you will form bonds and friendships with your fellow study committee members that may literally last you the rest of your lives. That's been true for me and many other members of uh, study committees. Anybody that served on a study committee for City Club, could you just raise your hand? A lot of people. So those of you who are at the table, some of these folks, you might just talk to them about what that experience was like for them. It's a great opportunity. So if you'd like to know uh, more about the study committee opportunity, if you would like to pick up an application to serve on the committee, just uh, introduce yourself to the City Club's research and policy director, Tony Iracarino. Tony, where are you? Right there. Or talk to any one of these people that raised their hands. Uh, the applications to be on the committee are due at the end of the month, January 30th. Another of City Club's program committees, Agora, invites you to join them for a discussion about the role of media in our community. At Agora's Pints and Policy event next Tuesday, January 27th at 6 o'clock at 4th Street Brewing in downtown Gresham. A quick reminder that at the back of the room after our program today, you can purchase discounted books for the Citizen Read Book Club event next Wednesday, January 28th at the City Club offices, City Club Commons. Agora member Cynthia Townsend, Cynthia, back of the room, will be selling the books. Uh, the book is Kafka Comes to America, an important book by Stephen Wax, who happens to be the Oregon uh, Federal Public Defender, and he's going to be at the event speaking and answering your questions and answers. Finally, next Friday, here at the Friday Forum, January 30th, our program will feature Multnomah County Commissioner, uh, Commission Chair Ted Wheeler, who will give his State of the County Address. For more details and information about all of these and other City Club programs, please go to the club's website. And now for our program. In the aftermath of Barack Obama being elected president, how many times in the last month have we heard and seen African Americans say that they have never thought they would see such a thing occur in their lifetimes? And indeed, fewer than 50 years ago, it was nearly impossible for African Americans to vote in many parts of the United States. Literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, outright racist intimidation and threats, and indeed sometimes violence, prevented people of color from casting their ballots as American citizens. As part of the historic, slow, usually ugly, and sometimes bloody civil rights struggle, the passage of the Federal Voting Rights Act in 1965 was a hallmark in the uh, evolution of the American political system. And the continuation of that long arc of political history has now brought us a president and a first family unlike any this country has ever seen before due to the simple but profound difference in their race from what we have ever seen before. So, is the election of Barack Hussein Obama as the President of the United States the watershed political moment in our country that it seems? Or are we now in a post-racial society as some have suggested? Or is President Obama's election just another step on the unfinished journey for our society and our political system on the road to racial justice, equality, and harmony? Now, these are important questions to consider, and with us today is an Oregon public figure well-suited to address them. Our speaker today is the president of Willamette University in Salem, a recognized leader in higher education who has lectured and written extensively. His numerous successes in his 10 years uh, of leading Willamette include, among other things, establishing and funding four new academic centers of excellence, planning and funding a new digital arts academic building to open uh, this fall, dedicating a new college of law building, expanding the professional business management program of the university's Atkinson Graduate School to Portland, raising $122 million since 2002 in the university's campaign for Willamette, and perhaps most importantly and remarkably, given how institutions like universities can be, being highly valued, respected, and admired by his board of directors, the school students, and the Willamette University community generally. Our speaker has served as a member of uh, several leading national boards and committees, including the Harvard University Board of Overseers, 
the American Association of Higher Education, and the World Affairs Council of Oregon. He holds a doctorate from Harvard University where he taught in the English department and was the dean of one of Harvard's 13 undergraduate colleges. On a more personal note, I'm told he has a special lecture on author Mary Shelley's most famous book, Frankenstein, which I don't think we're gonna to hear today. Uh, he's an excellent cook, a marathon runner, a huge Red Sox fan, and is the proud father of three very nice kids, two of whom we're pleased to have with us today. Uh, he has served as a moderator for City Club's political debates, but this is the first time he has spoken from this microphone. Please give, us a, a, please give a warm City Club welcome to President of Willamette University, Dr. Lee Pelton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. You, you know, your introduction reminds me of uh, a time when uh, Golder, Golda Meir was... Uh, she was the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, uh, and she was at a state function where one of her aides was, was uh, going to be bestowed an award, and the, and, the, and the moderator went on and on and on and with uh, wonderful acc accolades. Uh, and you know, she's a short, uh, was d diminutive woman, and, and, and so as the aide got up to, uh, you know, in full uh, bloom to accept this award, she grabbed him by the, sh by the uh, coat sleeves and said, don't be so humble, Sonny, you're not that great. <laughs> and uh, so, the day after the presidential election, the following appeared in The Onion, an online satirical publication that describes itself as America's finest news source. <laughs> this was the headline. Black man given nation's worst job. <laughs> November 5th, 2008, Washington, D.C., African-American man Barack Obama, 47, was given the least desirable job in the entire country Tuesday when he was elected President of the United States of America. In his new high-stress, low-reward position, Obama will be charged with such tasks as completely overhauling the nation's broken down economy, repairing the crumbling infrastructure, and generally having to please more than 300 million Americans and cater to their every whim on a daily basis. <laughs> As part of his duties, the black man will have to spend four to eight years cleaning up the messes other people left behind. <laughs> and the job comes with such intense scrutiny and so certain a guarantee of failure that only one other person even bothered applying for it. <laughs> Said scholar and activist Mark L. Denton, it just goes to show you that in this country, a black man still can't catch a break. <laughs> so, there you go. Though we may uh, chuckle politely or even laugh nervously at the delicious irony captured in this story, embedded in it are the distinctive American racial tensions and dislocations that will not disappear in a single presidential election, even if the man elected is the first African American president. In recent months and weeks, there's been much discussion about the significance of Obama's presidency and its impact on the thorny topic of race in America. Indeed, it is nearly impossible these days to pick up any magazine or newspaper or turn on the television or radio without reading or hearing a reference to race, which as we now understand is as much or more a social construct than a biological one. Race, which is really our proxy for race relations, is discussed rapaciously. In some instances, it is a discussion conducted in whispered tones, sometimes with pride and excitement, other times with anxiety and something approaching despair. Among those voices are those who fear that Obama's presidency will mean that the interests of black America and other Americans of color will be, will be disproportionately represented and favored in Washington, D.C. at the expense of the interests of the real hard-working Americans 
as they were variously described by some of the candidates during the primaries and the general election. Others worry that Obama's election may have the effect of discouraging and even damaging serious public policy discussions about racial inequality because his presidency surely signals the arrival of African Americans after years of slavery and Jim Crow laws. The playing field has been leveled and we can therefore now turn our attention away from race to other national social issues presumed to be more urgent. Still another fear was expressed by Brown University Pre Professor Glenn Lowry when he said, I think that the country as a whole is looking for a reason to get out of the mire of racial, racial politics and racial discussion. And I think Obama's offer to the country is that his very person, his very success in his electoral ambition is a kind of expiation of collective racial sin. Obama's presidency does not mean that African Americans will be entitled over whites, nor does it mean that the elimination of racial issues and racial discrimination. And it certainly does not mean that we now live in a new post-racial America. However, it is the beginning of something important and vital to our future. It is the beginning of a more transparent public discourse on race that is long overdue. One that admits the complexities of racial identity, one that has for too long been held in places of private refuge, in black and white barbershops, in black and white beauty parlors, in black and white dinner tables, in secret societies, in certain clubs, in boardrooms, and yes, even in black and white pulpits on Sunday morning, the hour, as we all know too well, is the most segregated hour of the week. Obama reminds us in his powerful A More Perfect Union Philadelphia address of the importance of moving beyond what he called the racial stalemate we've been stuck in for years. He said, race is an issue that I believe this nation cannot afford to ignore right now. We would be making the same mistake that Reverend Wright made in his offending sermons about America, to simplify and stereotype and amplify the negative to the point that it distorts reality. The fact is that the comments that have been made and the issues that have surfaced over the last few weeks reflect the complexities of race in this country that we've never really worked through, a part of our union that we have yet to perfect. And if we walk away now, if we simply retreat into our respective corners, we will never be able to come together and solve challenges like healthcare or education or the need to find good jobs for every American. So the real genius of Obama is that his presidency does not seek to transcend race as some would have it but rather he asserts that only by embracing with bravery and a sympathetic imagination the fullness and complexities of race will we have any chance of coming together as a nation to meet the great challenges of the future. And what is it that made it possible for Obama's presidency to arrive as it did, to borrow his own words, at this defining moment at this time in American history? And I believe the answer lies in his personal narrative on the one hand and in the narrative of our country on the other, or to put it more precisely, his own narrative and that of our country met in a perfect confluence of ideas and hopes about the unfolding future of the United States. Obama arrived on the national stage at a time in Americans' history when the prominence of a few notable African Americans had broadened the visibility and acceptability of American African leadership. After all, among the most powerful women in our country are two African-American women, Oprah Winfrey and Condoleezza Rice. And the growing list of African-Americans who have or had what we might call crossover appeal, especially in popular culture, beginning with Bill Cosby, helped to pave the way for his acceptability. Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, the writer Michael Grunwald calls these men and women no demands blacks. 
their acceptance by whites was not predicated on whites having to give up anything fundamental or betray their convictions or untangle a major stereotype. And among America's leading public intellectuals included a growing list of African American academics, Cornell West, Skip Gates, Randall Kennedy, Michael Eric Dyson, Patricia, Patricia Williams, and William Julius Wilson, and so on. The nation has changed, Obama asserted in his A More Perfect Union Address, a fact that Reverend Wright did not fully comprehend, and that change had been most visible in the world of politics, where there are now almost three dozen African Americans in the U.S. House of Representatives. Nor should be overlooked the African American mayors of major American cities, beginning with Carl Stokes in Cleveland in 1967, Tom Brady uh, in Los Angeles of 1973, or David Dinkins, New York City, 1989, the same year that Douglas Wilder became governor of Virginia. And Obama was not the first African American to run for president of the United States, Shirley Chisholm, 1972, Jesse Jackson Sr. in 84 and 88, in which he was second in the delegate count, Alan Keyes and Carol Braun. And thus, if we look closer at Obama's election, historically significant and as exhilarating as it is, we come to understand that it is more evolutionary than revolutionary. And it was his personal history that America found so compelling. I've got relatives who look like Bernie Mac, and I've got relatives who look like Margaret Thatcher, he said. <laughs> And in his A More Perfect Union address, he proudly declared, I am the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. I was raised with the help of a white grandfather who survived a depression to serve in Patton's army during World War II and a white grandmother who worked on a bomber assembly line at Fort Leavenworth while he was overseas. I've gone to some of the best schools in America and lived in one of the world's poorest nations. I am married to a black American who carries within her the blood of slaves and slave owners, an inheritance we pass on to our two precious daughters. I have brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, uncles, and cousins of every race and every hue scattered across three continents, and for as long as I live, I will never forget that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. It's a story that hasn't made me the most conventional candidate but it is a story that has seared into my genetic makeup, the idea that this nation is more than the sum of its parts and that out of the many, we are truly one. And with these words, Obama reimagines, he reclaims, he reinvigorates, he renews and remakes two defining distinctively American ideas. E pluribus unum, out of the many one, and the belief, according to Thomas Jefferson, that all men were created equal. And it is this ideal of diversity, different American stories bound together by a common purpose that gave agency and life to his campaign and paved the way for his eventual victories in the primaries and the general election. The alignment of this ideal with the hopes of America is what voters found so compelling. Obama did not grow up in continental America, and he lived outside of the United States and Indonesia for a large portion of his early childhood. And with the possible exception of Thomas Jefferson, he is the most cosmopolitan of American presidents. He is a citizen of the world, and of course, without exception, he is the most multicultural of American presidents. It is his cosmopolitanism and his multiculturalism that converged in a sense with the future of America, its rapidly growing global perspective and its rapidly growing multicultural population. So con consider this, for example. The Educational Testing Service predicts that by 2015, more students of color will be enrolled in higher education than white students in three states, Hawaii, California, and New Mexico, and the District of Columbia. Six other states will have populations of students of color over 40%, and Texas will be evenly divided between white students and students of color. Or consider this. A report in August of 2008 from the U.S. Census Bureau projects that in about three decades, in other words, in the lifetime 
of Obama's daughters and their parents as well, non-Hispanic whites will no longer make up the majority of the population. And whereas non-Hispanic whites now make up about two-thirds of the population, they will account for less than half in 2050. A report from the Pew Research Center in, in 2008 projects that of the nation's children in 2050, two out of three are expected to have a minority ethnicity. And so in this sense then, Obama's biography, his personal narrative, seems especially in step with America's unfinished narrative of the 21st century. Now perhaps more than any other in American history, this presidential election can be seen as a battle between competing narratives. We had the war hero whose allegiance to the Iraq war was out of step with most Americans. His running mate was a hard scrabble, pull herself up by the bootstraps hockey mom whose old school republicanism to some seemed not congenial with a gentler and more compassionate and inclusive America. In the Democratic primaries, Hillary Rodden Clinton set out to prove that she was as tough as her male senatorial counterparts. Her campaign strategy and tactics were based on this premise at a time when the nation craved freshness and new, bold ideas. In the end, the young, cosmopolitan, multicultural, tech-savvy candidate won because he was able to tap into the themes of hope and redemption. His was an undying faith in what America might become at its very best if citizens were willing to set aside their differences and work together with a collective resolve. And nowhere was Obama's narrative alignment with America's future more evident than in the tremendous enthusiasm that he generated among young voters, especially those who had gone to college or university. In the presidential election, if you were under the age of 30, you were more likely to vote for Obama. If you were a senior citizen, you were more likely to vote for the 72-year-old McCain. And if the election seemed to some of us as if it represented a generational shift in American politics and culture, well, it was. Young and new voters were targeted by the campaign more intensively than ever before a strategy that paid dividends. First-time voters who made up 10% of the electorate were three times as likely to vote for Obama. Obama captured a whopping 34% more of the under 30-year-old voters in McCain, demolishing the 19% lead held by Bill Clinton in 1996. He also won the votes of 56% of women who made up 53% of the electorate. Equally important, while Obama collected 45% of the white vote, he won almost all of the black votes, which were up by 2% in total. And one in five new voters was black, almost twice the proportion of black people among the electorate, clearly demonstrating the enthusiasm among young African Americans uh, generated by the campaign. The African American vote for Obama is especially important, not only because he received more than nine out of 10 of their votes, but because he eventually convinced black America that he was a viable candidate for president. As you know, there's been much discussion about the divide between the older African American generation political leadership and Obama, who represented a new type of African American leader, the former having been trained during the civil rights movement. Obama was only two years old when King gave his I Have a Dream speech, and he did not grow up in the segregated South. As one author puts it, Sharing these experiences wasn't a prerequisite for gaining the acceptance of black leaders. This newly emerging class of black politicians, however, men and a few women closer in age to Obama and Jesse Jr., seek a broader political brief. Comfortable inside the establishment, they are just as likely to see themselves as ambassadors to the black community as they are to see themselves as spokesmen for it, which often means extolling middle class virtues and values in urban neighborhoods. Their ambitions range well beyond safely black seats. Early in the Democratic primary, almost half of the members of the U.S. House of Representatives Black Caucus, as well as African-American ministers and mayors, were committed to Hillary Rodden 
Clinton, not Obama, because she and her husband had advanced African-American interests, and most important, because there was a feeling that she could win the presidency. She was the presumptive Democratic nominee. And it was thought among some that Obama, who had not come up through the political ranks as they had, could not win the presidency. And I must confess that I, too, did not believe that Obama could win the Democratic nomination until the night of January 8th, 2008, when he lost, not won, the New Hampshire primary to Hillary Clinton. For me, at least, New Hampshire was a signal event for Obama's surge towards the Democratic nomination, just as it was, ironically, for Bill Clinton 16 years earlier in 1996. New Hampshire demonstrated that Obama could gain a significant percentage of votes in a statewide election as opposed to the idiosyncratic caucuses in which the population was overwhelmingly white. And though he was the runner-up in New Hampshire, the race was very close. Less than 8,000 votes separated the two candidates, with Clinton winning 39% of the vote and Obama taking 36.5. New Hampshire was tactically important because Clinton and Obama received an equal number of delegates to the National Convention because the percentage of their votes were so close. And by the time the Clinton forces fully understood how a change in the Democratic primary rules from a winner-take-all to a propor proportionality had changed the nexus of campaign strategy, it was too late because Obama was winning with votes and with a surging momentum. On the night of the New Hampshire primary, I watched Clinton's victory speech. I also watched Obama's concession speech. And Obama spoke as if he were the winner not the loser. And frankly, up until that moment, I had not paid much attention to him because like so many others, I considered Clinton to be the heir apparent to the presidency. This, of course, was her time. However, Obama's eloquence, his soaring rhetoric, his confidence, his commanding demeanor, his intelligence, his grasp of complex ideas, his symphonic message of hope and change, and working together with a common purpose made me an Obama supporter on the spot. And I began to hope and then later believe something that I had not dared to hope before, that it might be possible after all for an African American to become our country's next president. Obama won the election because those who voted for him saw in him the future of these United States. He affirmed that we might embrace sweetly and joyously our differences as long as we understood that we are joined together in common hope. And he affirmed that we might dream about a better tomorrow for our nation and for the children who will inherit it. Obama occupies what the anthropologists call the liminal ground, the space between the spaces. His growing up, one foot firmly planted in white culture and the other in black culture, provided him with a perspective that liberated him from a too ready acceptance of perceived notions, a perspective that allowed him to imagine diversity with freshness. He embodies the new diversity. He is cosmopolitan. He is a citizen of the world, a fact not lost on the applauding nations in Europe, Asia, and Africa, who too look to him with expectant eyes. He won the election because his particularly American narrative was aligned with America's promise of a new beginning, a narrative that he poignantly remarked was not even possible in any other country on earth. He is the new Adam in whom race can be seen as a metaphor for the democratic project at large, the common enterprise of many divergent people and perspectives acting together in shared interests. So listen to what he said to us on his inaugural day at the dawn of a new beginning. For we know that our patchwork heritage is a strength, not a weakness. We are a nation of Christians and Muslims, Jews and Hindus and non-believers. We are shaped by every language and culture drawn from every end of this earth. And because we have tasted the bitter swill of 
Civil war and segregation emerged from that dark chapter stronger and more united. We cannot help but believe that the old hatreds shall someday pass, that the lines of tribe shall soon dissolve, that as the world grows smaller, our common humanity shall reveal itself and that America must play its role in ushering in a new peace of, uh, era of peace. When a little more than 72 hours ago, Barack Hussein Obama, with his left hand on the same Bible that witnessed the swearing in of Abraham Lincoln as the 16th president of the United States, his right hand raised and said in his characteristic measured cadence these 35 words repeated by 43 men before him, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the president of the United States and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. At least that is what he would have said had the Chief Justice <laughs> not blown his line. I wept, and I wept for my parents. I wept for Mama Avery, my grandmother, who lived next door and helped raise me. I wept for my children and my children's children, and I wept for you and me. I wept tears of joy that seemed to wash away, at least for this special transcendent moment, years of weariness and of toil and of the jangling discords that Martin Luther King said would transform our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood if, as he cautioned, we would make the right choice. In 1954, when the Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that segregated schools were unconstitutional, I was a four-year African-American kid from a working-class family in Wichita, Kansas. I would enter kindergarten in the fall. I lived on a street that divided two distinct neighborhoods, poor African-Americans to the south and middle-class whites to the north. And many of the homes in the African-American neighborhood were what we called shotgun houses. That is, standing in the front yard with the front and back doors open, you could fire a shotgun clean through them to the backyard. And I grew up in a house that lacked indoor plumbing until the year I started kindergarten. And most of the kids in my part of the neighborhood came from families of laborers like my father who worked as a butcher in a meatpacking plant and like my mother who cleaned houses for middle class and rich white families. My great-grandparents made a meager living as sharecroppers near Little Rock, Arkansas, where important civil rights battles over the soul and dignity of this nation were waged. My father and mother attended segregated public schools. And after Brown, I had a choice that neither of my parents had growing up. Rather than attend the segregated African-American schools several miles to the south, I could attend the white school a short three blocks to the north. And this was a very easy decision then. My parents sent me to the white school because of its better facilities and fewer students per classroom. However, during my elementary school years, each school remained de facto segregated, one overwhelmingly white and the other overwhelmingly African-American. And today, the African-American elementary school no longer exists, and the white school that I attend attended as predominantly Latino. In 1916, John Dewey described democracy as the most ethical aspiration conceived by ethical communities. This aspiration was unobtainable, he wrote, without a society's commitment to lifelong education to develop the capacities for associated living in a society characterized by complexity and diversity. As a nation committed to equality and social justice, our hope is that out of the rich diversity of human experience, we can create communities of learning, communities made both beautiful and effective by their pluralism, communities of learning that will turn the tide of human want into a sea of joy and light. Female and male, Christian and Jew, African-American, white, Latino, Native American, Muslim, and Asian, gay and straight, we must find what binds us all together in common hope and need, not what divides us. 
We may or may not all come to love one another, but to be part of the best of this place, we must have the moral courage to respect one another. And this is the American dream, not the kind of dream that is available only to those privileged by history or family income, not the kind of dream that is built on a narrow self-interest, but rather a compelling vision of what we could be if we were truly open to the best that is known and thought in the world. The kind of dream which will swing open wide the doors of opportunity, which sets the table for all to enjoy life's bounty, and which holds our nation's motto, e pluribus unum, out of the many, one, as a living creed. And this, I submit, is the democratic vista that Obama's presidency offers to each of us. Thank you very, very much. first question for our speakers always will be from our Board of Governors host. Our Board of Hosts today is Melody Rose. Melody Rose is the Chair of Political Science at Portland State University. 2007, she was chosen by the Northwest Women's Journal as one of Portland's 100 most powerful women. <clears throat> and in 2008, she received PSU Alumni Association's Distinguished Faculty Award. She has been a member of City Club since 2004, is the chair of the club's Friday Forum Committee that arranges these uh, events, and is in her first year as a member of the Board of Governors. Melody? Thank you very much for the introduction, Jim, and thank you, Dr. Pelton, for your words of wisdom and inspiration. I'm tempted to ask a question about the Obama administration being a political scientist, but I suspect that there will be many questions from the floor on that subject. So rather, I'd like to use your expertise uh, in another genre uh, today for my question. As I shared with you over lunch, I was very intrigued by the opinion piece that you wrote in last week's Oregonian about the doors of opportunity in private education. So my question for you today is, what is the public purpose of the private university? Uh, the, the question is, what is the public purpose of a private university? Um, well, I, if, if I could just uh, recap some of the things that I said in the, the editorial, which uh, to remind us that a student attending a private college, uh, attending an, an Oregon private college, is twice as likely as a student attending an Oregon public college to complete his or her baccalaureate degree in four years. Um, it is also the case that for um, some students, the cost of attendance uh, to a private college uh, on a net basis uh, is less expensive than attending a public uh, college or university uh, on a net basis. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just say, uh, Willamette, although we are not a, um, an urban public university the way PSU is, nevertheless we have as a center part of, a centerpiece of our, uh, of our uh, motto and of our uh, purpose is to advance the cause of the nation uh, by providing access to young men and women um, of talent uh, and interests and abilities uh, to attend colleges where they can assume uh, leadership positions uh, in the nation. Uh, and I might say that one of the untold stories of the uh, presidency, Obama's presidency, uh, is to note that I think for the first time in the history of this country, uh, we have the ascendancy of black leaders, African American leaders, to the executive branch of government, the federal government. 
Uh, it's happened um, in, in other uh, parts of government, but not at the executive level. Uh, and one needs only to read the pedigrees <laughs> of uh, Obama uh, and these uh, men and women to understand the role that private education has played uh, in providing what uh, Justice uh, uh, Connor once called as the, uh, the path to leadership, making the path to leadership visible uh, to young women and men. Uh, from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. Uh, this is the time for uh, questions from the uh, floor. Uh, asking a question at a Friday Forum is a privilege of City Club membership, so I ask you to identify yourself. <coughs> Excuse me, as City Club member, please try to keep your question to 30 seconds or less. Make sure it's a question and not a speech, and uh, <coughs> we'll go until a uh, quarter after. Thank you. Paul Milius, Club member. Um, you touched somewhat on uh, um, President Obama's atypical uh, grow, growing up as an African American. Uh, would you care to elaborate on how the how that atypical? I mean, there are many African Americans who have white, who are biracial indeed, um, but he seems to have come up in a very different uh, milieu. Would you care to comment on how much that contributed to? Uh, his worldview and perhaps uh, to his victory as a, a, a presidential candidate. Yeah, but I, I, as I said, I, I think that uh, growing up in uh, two cultures, actually several cultures, uh, liberated him in a sense and gave him a broader perspective, I think, on uh, race. It allowed, gave him the sense uh, of, of, um, of uh, perspective on different cultures. Uh, and a kind of uh, sensitivity and sensibility uh, to the complexity of race, which, uh, which I think he expressed so eloquently uh, in his uh, speech in Philadelphia. Uh, and I think all of that contributed uh, to his, uh, um, contributed to his, uh, sort of the curve of his development uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the campaign. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. I wonder if you would care to share with us some of your own experience heading what has been a very white school in a very white community. I lived in Salem for nine and a half years yeah. and I didn't know many African Americans there. Right. Neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, let me say that Willamette has been wonderfully uh, welcoming uh, for me as uh, president. Uh, and there must be something particular about the uh, air in Oregon that, ble that, 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 that produces African-American university presidents, <laughs> because at one time there were three of us in the state uh, in a single uh, moment. Uh, you know, rather than giving you some specific um, instances of which uh, there, uh, there, are, there are many, I, I, I think that there have been times when um, there is a sense that um, I talked too much about diversity. I talked too much about uh, uh, this issue. Um, and, um, but I think it's important. I think it's central. Uh, it's certainly central to uh, Willamette, and I'm, you know, I'm proud to say that we, uh, at one time, it may still be the truth, may be, still be true that we are uh, the most uh, diverse um, four-year undergraduate university uh, in the state. John Leeper, City Club member. Sir, I am a retired soldier. As such, I served during World War II when the services were segregated during the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And I would just like to get your perspective on the significance of President Truman's order desegregating the services well before the schools became desegregated and the impact it likely had on society in general. A great question, and the impact was uh, enormously favorable uh, in this regard. And, and again, I think one of the stories not often told uh, is uh, the fact that the military has been a leader uh, in this nation 
uh, in, a, in accommodating and bringing um, African Americans in particular uh, into its uh, ranks uh, at all levels, of which uh, I suppose Colin Pyle uh, is uh, the best representative example. Virginia Cornyn, sing, uh, City Club member. Currently, there is a book that all Oregonians are being asked to read called Stubborn Twig, which talks about the discrimination against the Japanese, particularly in the state of Oregon. Is there a book or a couple of books that you would recommend to those of us, uh, also former English major, who um, find reading a, a good way to develop our multicultural perspectives? Well, in fact, we have two professors at uh, Willamette who've produced uh, books, I think both of them uh, narratives of uh, Japanese Americans who were interred in, um, uh, in those very dark days. I don't have the titles on the tip of my tongue, but I promise you at the end of this program I can get those titles to you. Jeannie Crouch, City Club member, thank you for your remarks today. Bringing the, uh, uh, the Obama's discussion about race relations a little bit closer to home, uh, our former mayor, Tom Potter, has uh, identified race relations as something that's uh, an undertone to this city that we deeply need to address. And in addition, when I look around the City Club Friday forums, I note that we don't have nearly as much diversity as I think many of us would like to have in this room. Um, if you were asked to be an advisor to the city or to the city club, what would you tell us to do about um, uh, bringing more diversity under our own tent? Great question. One that I've been <laughs> thinking about broadly uh, uh, over uh, recently. Um, Portland is a wonderful place to live, uh, and it has a deserved reputation for uh, progressive liberal thinking. However, it's my experience that our too ready acceptance uh, of this uh, description gets in the way of our uh, capacity uh, to uh, understand that there, you know, there, there, there are a number of other issues, especially around race uh, and folks uh, of, of uh, color that need to be uh, attended to. And so, you know, whereas, you know, being progressive and liberal is, you know, is, uh, for the city is a, is a I think, a, um, uh, at least given my political perspective, uh, a good place uh, to be. But it's my, my encounter with that is that there are likely to be more discussions around, and these are all important discussions, but more discussions around uh, environment, uh, sustainability, um, and so on and so forth than there are about around race and politics. And somehow we need to break out of this, uh, I think this sort of comfortable place uh, that we are in. Uh, as a city, and the easy answer to that, um, I guess a difficult answer as well, is that it's going to provide some leadership. Uh, and these are issues that are not going to go away. There's no fix to, um, uh, to these issues. They are ongoing, um, difficult, complex issues that uh, require a lot of time and effort and thought. I, I agree with all of that, and I think it's the intention of, of many Oregonians to be inclusive. And, and so I guess what I try to get my mind around is what, what as a practical matter, does one do? Well, what, whatever, your, whatever, whatever business that you're in or whatever organization that you are in, uh, it means abandoning policies and practices and procedures and practical sorts of things that you do that are part of the status quo. And I cannot tell you what those are, but it requires uh, cre creativity, imagination, and it requires outreach. And without outreach and without stepping outside of the sort of the comfortable 
um, a box in which many of us live, uh, they're just, there's the, 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 the capacity for change is, is really very, very small. Um, my name is Ray Guggen. I'm, an, I'm a member of City Club. And maybe I'm changing the topic just a bit, but uh, in, in relationship to the big part that the military had in uh, integrating uh, black people into the, into the general population, what is your opinion about the don't tell, uh, don't ask, uh, present solution for uh, homosexuals? Great question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. How much time do I have? Uh, can I get a lifeline, maybe? Um, uh, my, my own view, and I, and I know this is, I, I, at least as I understand it, this is not a view shared by uh, the, the uh, current president. Um, my, my own view is that as a practical matter, I suppose it has, it has uh, done what it was supposed to do. But um, it does not, in my, in my opinion, uh, represent the best ideals of this country. Uh, and um, so I, I guess I, my advice would be to the president that when he talked so passionately about um, how um, our practices ought to be aligned with our ideals uh, with respect to uh, foreign um, policy. Uh, I would respectfully uh, request that he give the same consideration uh, to this policy uh, as it affects uh, gays in the military. So he and I, I think, thank you. Uh, he and I depart company on this issue, if, if I understand uh, his, his perspective on it. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan Rodmacher, City Club member and Bearcat. Um, thanks, Lee, for your comments. Uh, I know that since the University of Michigan decisions have come out, diversity is, if not a dirty word, perhaps a dangerous word in, higher, in institutions of higher learning because of the funding issues and whether or not funding could be pulled if a university does the wrong thing with diversity. Do you anticipate that will change one way or the other? You could, I could, you could see it going either way after an Obama administration. Great question. Well, I, I, there are two issues there. They're related but not the same. One has to do with affirmative action, uh, which is a legal construct. And as we know, that's been affirmed by uh, the Supreme Court in, 2000, in July of 2003 uh, with the Michigan cases. And the other has to do with diversity. Uh, I think all of us in uh, higher education had to adjust our um, practices and policies uh, to meet the uh, to meet the uh, new regulations. But keep in mind that t in 2003, the, the court affirmed um, the 1978 ruling of Justice Powell that essentially said that diversity is a compelling um, uh, interest uh, in the nation. And so that is what guides our uh, work today. I, I think what we're going to see, John, is a, uh, and this is what I'm trying to suggest in my talk to you, is a kind of recalibration of uh, diversity. And the diversity will become uh, more cosmopolitan. Uh, so it will have a global perspective. It will also have, have a, a more inclusive perspective. Uh, and, um, and I cannot imagine how we can talk about diversity and not talk about class uh, as, 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 as well. And so I see all of this, I see this growth, I see this as growth and, and movement in a, in a positive, positive direction. Bill Homer, City Club member, and as the son of a political science professor at Willamette and the father of, uh, of a, a student at Willamette who is now teaching school in Tanzania, I'm asking a question on her behalf which is, uh, which she's very interested in is, what is the status of the establishment of an African studies program at Willamette? Good question. Uh, we don't have an African uh, studies program there. We do have an ethnic studies program, as you may know, which is really quite unusual for a small 
uh, uh, liberal arts uh, college. Uh, but there are serious discussions underway uh, uh, in this regard, and it would be my uh, hope, and it would be something I would anticipate that, uh, that at some point in the near future that that would emerge as a uh, part of our curriculum. Patty Farrell, City Club member. I'm interested in your thoughts about the um, stubbornness of the achievement gap in K-12 education and what, can, what we can be doing about that. Yeah, big big topic. I'll, I'll just I, I've got I'll just I'll be brief. I think the most important thing that we can do uh, is to understand that education is a seamless activity from pre-K uh, through college, and that uh, high schools and colleges and universities, and secondary and post-secondary places of education, need to work together. Uh, on this uh, very uh, important uh, imp important uh, issue. So thank you very much. I want to just briefly say that, as was uh, intimated, uh, the club has a lot of work to do on uh, issues like the ones that were discussed today. We actually do have a strategic planning process in place. Uh, both last night and the night before last, we had discussions with uh, focus groups, very diverse uh, from throughout the city, people who are not involved in City Club, and there are definite themes about what we can do to uh, change our own practices and procedures to break out of the status quo, so we're working on it. Um, please join us next week for the State of the uh, County Address with Multnomah County Chair Ted Wheeler. Don't forget that you can buy your discounted books for the uh, January 28th Citizen Read in the back of the room. And as uh, we close, please help me again express our appreciation to the very thoughtful remarks of our speaker, Dr. Lee Pelton. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>